Hey guys, happy Christmas or happy Boxing Day as we say in the UK. Boxing Day is December 26th. It has nothing to do with Amazon boxes or getting rid of packages, but uh, actually Boxing Day. But uh, yeah, it's a holiday anyway in the UK, but I hope you had a great Christmas uh, wherever you're at. I had a really good time, good relaxing day with my family and enjoyed that. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to all that God has in this season and to moving forward with lots of great things. Uh, this weekend, I'm going to be speaking on leaving the old behind and stepping into the new. I'm going to be talking this Sunday. Uh, my church is about Joshua. You know, Joshua spent 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the desert, and 40 years in the promised land. And it's like, I'm going to be speaking from Joshua 1, where the first word in Joshua 1 is, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now rise, let's go over this Jordan. And um, I'm going to be speaking about that season as well, where... You know, for years and years and years, Joshua had been thinking and getting ready. One day God's going to do this. One day God's going to do that. And that day arrives and how to, how to move into, how to let go of yesterday and move into the tomorrow. God has for you. So if you're around Massachusetts or Connecticut this weekend, uh, you don't want to miss that really great life changing message uh what else is going on you know at the beginning of january i'm actually going to be preaching for at least six weeks uh from the book of ephesians so i'm going to take everybody through a verse by verse study of ephesians of who we are in christ jesus i'm going to be teaching on the the past tense of the epistles and how we're blessed in heavenly places with every blessing in christ jesus i'm going to be speaking about ephesians uh 110 where it says in the dispensation of the fullness of times, God's going to gather the things of heaven and the things of earth together in Christ Jesus. And uh, so really uh, looking forward to doing that. Um, hey, I'm going to be plowing ahead with some new media projects as well. Some things I've been working on in the background. So more announcements about those later. Uh, what else is happening? My uh, uh, ministry school is going well. We're going to soon uh, be hitting uh, 50 people, I believe. Have some new people coming on in uh, the month of January. We're going to be starting a, a church planting module as well. I'm working with some folks wanting to plant churches there. So if you're interested, it's not too late to join. I've kind of def designed, defined, designed the ministry school as something that you can just jump on at any different stage. Uh, so check that out as well. Good. Um, in the first few months, I hope to be doing some uh, mission trips as well to Jamaica. Hope to be back in Wales in, I think, the month of March. And also be going to Texas and Florida maybe in February. So uh, just some great things there. Hey, let me just share something with you quick for, quickly for today as well that I hope would be a blessing to you. Um, I've been doing some study on prayer in the last few weeks and... Uh, you know, Jesus had a radically different prayer life to everybody around him. I think at times one of the dangers in prayer is when we think we're good at it. One of the dangers in prayer is, um, you know, some of the religious baggage we bring to it. Somebody asked me a question a week ago and it was, it's not like it was controversial and I didn't want to go there, but I know how much it could hurt people. And um, no, I'm going to say this. Here's my point. I think sometimes we, we've allowed this idea to creep into the body of Christ that the more people we get praying about something, the more God will hear. It's like the kind of theory that says if you could fill a football stadium full of people, then <laughs> God might answer a little more. You know, if we could get 100,000 people crying out to God, then God might send revival. You know, that that is... There are really good people teaching that and good people following that, but that's not good theology. That's not good Bible. You know, in one sense, it's just really lacking in revelation. The idea that God's holding something out on us. God, God is not, uh, we don't have to beg God for anything. Of his fullness of we all receive grace for grace. Uh, John 1, 16, Colossians 2, 9 says in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The next verse, Colossians 2.10 says, we are complete in him. So we don't need to beg God for anything. Rather, we need the spirit of wisdom and revelation that we know what is ours in Christ Jesus. And then the faith to appropriate it, to bring it from 
the promises into actuality in our life. But even on that thing of prayer as well, this idea that the more people you get praying, the more God might move. I, I don't, don't think that's biblical, or at best, it's kind of Old Testament biblical. I'll tell you what I see in the New Covenant, and I just want to challenge you. I want to give you five quick keys for prayer today. But um, what I really see is <clears throat> actually the total opposite. I see God saying, where two or more can agree touching anything on heaven, it will be done on the earth. I think it's actually a really hard thing and a challenge to get two people on the same page in prayer rather than to try and get 100,000 people. And it's not like God is God needs, you know, this mass amount of people that most of us maybe can never gather to pray for something. Rather, you know, again, let me challenge you with two or three quick ideas today. What would what would life be like if God always answered our prayers? Again, just think of that for a minute. What would life be like? What would it look like if God always answered prayers? What would it be like if you and I could say, God answers every single prayer I ever prayed. There are no unanswered prayers. What would life be like if literally every single thing we prayed for happened? Okay, now I want to get your imagination going on that. Hey, a few quick thoughts on that. Firstly, I I think that's possible to get there. I actually think that's where Jesus lived. If you think about it, the apostles, they were good Jewish boys. They grew up in Jewish culture. They they were used to praying. They had a prayer for everything. I love that movie, movie uh, Fiddler on the Roof, where it, um, isn't it, the guy buys a sewing machine and he goes to the rabbi and says, is there a prayer for sewing machines? And the rabbi says, dude, there's a prayer for everything. We're Jews. And, and in Jewish culture, there literally was a prayer for everything. They prayed for this, they prayed for that, ceremonial prayers, prayers for the Sabbath, prayers for the sunrise, prayers at sunset. And yet when Jesus came along, Jesus had a really different way of praying. When Jesus prayed, stuff happened. Hmm. When Jesus prayed, God answered. When Jesus prayed, even the Pharisees came and said, where did you get this authority? Who gave you this? When we pray, it's nice. When you pray, demons scream and leave people. Blind eyes open. When you pray, bread is multiplied. When you pray, something different happens. And Jesus, I mean, he literally, with his disciples, he spoke about this relationship with God. Um, let me read that. John 14, verse 12. He says, most assuredly, definitely, this is not a light statement. He says to you, he that believes in me, the works that I do, will he do also, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to my Father. We've all heard that. And the next verse, he says, whatever, whatever, no qualifications, not whatever, with 10 little caveats here, whatever you ask the Father in my name, I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything, in my name, I will do it. Anything you ask in my name, I will do it. And I want to live in that place. And I believe the body of Christ should be living in that place where we pray a lot less, but when we pray, uh, things really happen. You know, I had a situation I've shared sometimes, and uh, I share less now because uh, some of the People involved are a little older and, I, you know, it's their story to tell. Don't want to embarrass them. But I had a situation, uh, you know, about 15, 18 years ago where uh, something happened in my family where that was just absolutely impossible, medically impossible. I'd never heard of one person healed of this condition. And uh, I went to God and saw breakthrough in that. And the reason I'm telling this, it's interesting, after everything came right and the doctors agreed with God and all that kind of thing. I had people come to me and say, why didn't you put it on our prayer chain? Why didn't you let us know so we could pray? Why didn't you put it out? Facebook wasn't out at the time, you know, social media, but that, that kind of thing. Why didn't you tell us so we could all go praying, 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 I'm praying, I'm praying. And I, I upset a lot of people by saying, hey, I didn't need 200 people praying. I needed maybe one or two who really believed this was actually going to happen. You know, there was a situation in the body of Christ in the last week, and I, I want to be really clear, I'm not criticizing anybody. You know, a very famous, awesome, one of the best churches on planet Earth were praying for something, and I, I have nothing negative to say about these guys. You, some of you know who they are, they're amazing, and I love them, and I celebrate them, but um, here, here's one thing. I'd encourage any of you to 
All right, let me be careful what I say here. Here's my point. We don't actually need thousands and thousands and thousands of people to be praying. What we need is the one or two who say, I actually believe this is going to happen. I love, uh, I've listened to some Andrew Warmuck recently. I think a man who's seen over 10 people raised from the dead. He saw, uh, you know, his own son raised from the dead when his son was in the morgue with a toe tag on, you know, shut away in a cabinet, blue face, you know, saw him raised from the dead. Uh, you know, in the ministry in this summer, the summer of 2019, I think there was a baby raised from the dead live in the service. My point is like, learn from people like that who've done this again and again and again. And um, I, I think it's like that. Learn the lesson of Jairus. When Jairus comes to Jesus and says, my daughter lies at the point of death, Jesus shuts out all, he, he basically says to Jairus, I'm going to come and minister her. And Jairus doesn't say one word. He doesn't put out a prayer chain, doesn't put out of a million different people. He just locks in on Jesus. I want to give you five quick keys to at least moving towards that place where we see prayer consistently answered. Number one, I think we'll have to filter out a lot of prayers. I think we've got to not get so facile, so easy about saying, oh, I'm praying for this and I'm praying for that, I'm praying for you, praying for you, unless we actually really mean it. I'd rather be a person who prayed for you know, one thing a week and actually saw it happen than somebody who says they'll pray for, you know, little, every dog and cat, every little thing and um, not, you know, it, it would probably be annoying, but at times we should probably say, no, I'm not going to pray for you rather than say that we are when we're not really in faith. And I, I think at times if we'd actually pass things through the filter of do I... Do I really know that this is God's will? Do I really know that this is what God wants to do in this situation? I know that if I'm, for instance, ministering in a meeting, if I can really hear through word of knowledge of God, who's actually going to be healed. I know it's his will to heal everybody, but if I can actually narrow in there and say, Lord, what's actually going to happen? If I'd only pray for those people, I'd see nearly 100% results. So key number one, I think sometimes we should filter out all of the the random Christian culture prayer things that we do and really know, am I called to pray for this? Key number two, we should always come back to God's promises. The way I know God's will is not by feeling a goosebump or trying to see an angel or hear a little glitter somewhere. It's by this. God's word is God's will. God's word is God's thoughts. And rather than, let me put it that way, rather than um, spend a week praying for a situation, um, what we should do is maybe spend a week preparing our hearts to pray one prayer. Yeah, I mentioned the situation I had in my family. When this situation happened, I went to the Lord and the Lord showed me straight away that I wasn't in a place of faith to receive what I was praying for. The issue wasn't God's will. The issue was my unbelief. And the Lord told me to fast and pray for a week, not fast and pray for the healing of this person, but rather fast and pray to lose the doubt, the fear, the unbelief. Turn your eyes on Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things on earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And I spent a week fasting and praying, not praying for somebody else's need, praying just to get my heart to the place where it was clean and pure and I could walk in faith. And after one week of preparation then God said to me now you can pray and I prayed a five second prayer and I knew that I knew that I knew that I had the petition I desired of him 1 John 3 19 20 and 21 mm, boom so come to his word um, I think the third thing we've got to do is learn to hold God's word you know I think when most of us are missing it when we pray is we pray and then prayer becomes this sort of vague hope, wish, aspiration. God, it'd be really nice if you could do this. And then we kind of hope-ish something's happening and usually forget about it. And I think what we've got to learn to do in prayer is come, like Jairus came and got a hold of Jesus. And he locked onto, he was not letting go of Jesus. And when a woman wish an issue of blood came and, you know, they went through all of that story. It's like Jairus is not letting go of Jesus, the living word. And what we should do is come to God on the basis of his word, on the basis of his promise and said, God, you've said this and I am not letting go of it. And every day be, how do we hold on to God's word? We hold on by thinking. We hold on by thanking. We hold on by worshiping. Faith 
Faith's expression is thanksgiving and worship. Hope says, God, please do it. I know you'll do it one day. I know God will heal me. That means sometime in the future. Faith says, thank you. I know it's done. I know I've got it. You know, right now, and the period I speak about, my wife and I have just sold a house in France this week. And we've just bought another house in France this week. Now, I visited this house once six months ago. I don't have the keys. I don't have the, um, you know, I don't, I'm not sitting there holding the house in my physical possession. But I know when my uh, notaire, my lawyer in France sends me a document saying, you are now the legal owner of this house, the title deed, if he, um, Hebrews 11 verse 1 in the Amplified Bible, I can rightly say I am the owner of this house. I've still only been there once. It's like a memory to me, but I can hold that paper and say, I know this is my house. I can prove it's my house. I've got the, this isn't the house. This is the, the document that proves I have it. And all of the power of the French government, be that great or small, uh, stands behind that legal document. You know, all of the power of heaven stands behind this. So that third key to seeing your prayers answered is to be thinking and thanking and praising and celebrating and reading that promise and saying, I've got it. I'm not waiting to get it, I've got it. Hey, two more things that will really help us develop this lifestyle is testify, is talk about this, talk about the great things God has done, give God glory for every answer of prayer. When you do that, you're releasing anticipation, expectation in others, but you're also celebrating in your own heart, I have a God of breakthrough. We forget things so easily. We easily, you know, whenever we, do you know what it's like when you're in pain in your physical body and then either you get healed or maybe medical science or simply the pain, you know, your body naturally heals. My point is you don't have a memory. You have a memory of the fact you were in pain, but you can easily just forget all about that. And you can't even quite remember what it was like to be in pain. And here's my challenge to you. So often we're in need and it's this all consuming thing. How can I ever live? How can God ever come through here? And yet once we're through, we get used to normalcy we get used to life so easily that we forget and when we'll testify when we'll share with others both for others and ourselves we're creating a lifestyle of faith what's the fifth key repeat keep doing it keep asking God for things keep your faith invested keep building your faith I, I was I went for a walk today and I was actually working on building my faith for things that I may not ye need for 10, 20, 30 years. I want to sow my faith. I don't want to be, if I get hit with some financial need right now, I, it's too late to save. I've already saved. I have money in the bank, whatever. And my point is I want to have faith in my faith bank. I want to build my faith for the things coming in this year so that when the need comes i've already got enough faith for me and my faith's like a mark four like a great tree where the birds of the air can come and find shelter under so repeat keep your faith invested don't don't let crisis be the the starting point for your journeys of prayer and faith let intimacy with God, let God's promises, you be the initiator. Say, God, I'm going to look for something crazy to believe for when I don't even need it, when all is great in my life. So great uh, thoughts though. Go do, what does Paul say in Philippians 4? The things you've seen in me, heard, I've taught to you, do them and the God of peace will be with you. Boom. Hey, if you're on my uh, YouTube channel, why not hit the subscribe button down there or check out some of the links above or below, depending on where you're watching this. Um, connect with our email newsletter. We would love to hear from you. Bye for now.